I'm Martin Graeber, and this presentation is part of a planned series of videos based on talks that I've given on traditional song and related subjects. In this presentation, first given at the Broadside Day organised by the Traditional Song Forum and EFDSS in Glasgow in February 2019, I'm going to talk about the broadside printer William Clift of Sirencester. Sirencester is a quiet market town of 19,000 people in the southwest of England, centred on the network of roads created when it was the second largest town in Roman Britain. Over the years, Sirencester has had a number of jobbing printers, a few of whom produced broadsides and chapbooks, such as Samuel Rudder in the 18th century and Thomas Porter in the early 19th. There were also stationers such as Turner and Shatford, who sold broadsides printed in London, on which their names had been added to the list of country outlets. The most prolific printer of broadsides in 19th century Sirencester was William Clift. At the time I started the project, little was known about him but I have been able to add to the history of this small country printer. He was born at Stocks Farm at Bramley in Hampshire on the 7th of January 1787, the fourth son of a farmer also called William Clift. The Clift family had farmed in and around Bramley since 1673, and had he followed his father into farming, he would have been the fifth William Clift to do so. We do not know at present where Clift served his apprenticeship as a printer or where he worked before 1824 when he registered to operate a printing press in Sirencester. He was then aged 37. In January 1825, he placed an advertisement in the Oxford Journal saying that he begs respectfully to inform the public that he's opened a printing office adjoining the Ram Inn, where printing in general is neatly executed on very moderate terms. Stationery of all kinds, genuine patent medicines, perfumery, etc. Drugs, oils and colours, wholesale and retail, at the lowest prices. William Clift married Mary Maria Pierce at the Church of St John the Baptist Sirencester in July 1827. Mary was the daughter of John Pierce, who in 1802 had acquired the assets of a Mr Long, a druggist and oil and colour man in Sirencester. In 1803, Pierce received the licence to operate a printing press as part of that business. He died suddenly in May 1811, and the business was renamed A. Pierce & Co., suggesting that his wife Anne kept things going. She placed advertisements in local newspapers, but only for the sale of lottery tickets. These advertisements continued to appear regularly until 1825, which is when, it appears, Cliff took over the shop from the widow. In the record of the marriage, he was described as a bachelor and she as a spinster. Mary was already 42 by that time, so it's not surprising that they had no children. Clift's business prospered, and he placed a further advertisement in 1840, in which he returns his sincere thanks to the inhabitants of Sirencester and the neighbourhood for the very kind support he's received for nearly 20 years. His advertisement made the point, in capital letters, that he was charging 30% less than other printers in the town, and that through his connections he was able to offer writing paper for sale as cheap as any house in London. Mary Cliff died on the 4th of January 1847 and in the following year William put his property up for sale through the auctioneer W. H. Jeffreys. An advertisement appeared in the Gloucestershire Chronicle on the 2nd of September. 
The reason given for the sale was the declining health of the owner, who wished to retire. It gives a very complete description of the shop, the four-bedroom accommodation and extensive outbuildings. It also gives an indication of the size of the property, which I will come back to. Sadly, Cliff died on the day that the advertisement appeared. His body was laid to rest beside that of his wife in the Pierce family vault within the Lady Chapel of the Church of St John the Baptist. The stone slab memorialises John Pierce, Mary's father, and his mother Anne. The diamond-shaped brass plate records the death of John's wife Anne Pierce in 1841, and the rectangle below commemorates the deaths of Mary and William Clift. Three weeks later, the Wilts and Gloucestershire Standard carried the notice for the auction of Clift's goods and chattels. The list of items for sale gives us a glimpse of Clift's life and interests. Having found out a little about William Clift, I wanted to establish where his printing shop had been. Clift's 1825 advertisement reported his location as adjoining the Ram Inn. The 1841 census reported William and Mary Clift as dwelling between the Swan Inn and the Ram Inn, the only people living in this stretch, which is now called West Market Place. I mentioned that the advertisement for the sale of the business described a large yard and garden at the back, being in depth 236 feet with a frontage of 20 feet. This must have been a large part of the area bounded by West Market Place, Castle Street, Silver Street and Blackjack Street. In the years after Clift's death, the Ram Inn was demolished, Castle Street was widened and a range of Victorian Gothic buildings erected along it. West Market Place also underwent a lot of changes, but I can now say quite definitely where Clift lived and worked. The purchaser of Clift's shop was Henry Keyworth, who operated from there until he moved to new premises in 1854. Though he continued with most aspects of Clift's business, he did not print broadside ballads. In 1852 he published an engraving of Sirencester Marketplace, a copy of which is owned by the Bingham Library Trust. They kindly allowed me to see and photograph this engraving. A closer look clearly reveals Keyworth's printing office the premises he bought from William Clift. If you look at the area today, it's not immediately possible to identify exactly where this building stood. Victorian and modern developments have changed the layout of the area, and most of the buildings have acquired new fronts. In my search for Clift's premises, I've paced out distances and measured angles, and to get a better impression, we climbed the church tower on a clear day and got this photograph. I've overlaid the site of Clift's premises on this view. And this confirms that the print shop was located where the shop currently tenanted by Fatface stands, though the front of the shop has been rebuilt. William Clift operated as a printer in Sirencester for 23 years. Much of his output was ephemeral, and while there may be other examples of his printing resting in old archives, the best known are the broadside ballad sheets that he printed and sold. Just 100 of these are known about, and they can be found in three different collections. 89 sheets in the Madden Collection at Cambridge University Library, 
ten sheets in the William Stevens collection in Cricklade, and one sheet in the Harding collection in the Bodleian Library at Oxford. The Madden collection in the Cambridge University Library contains 89 broadsides by Clift, with 173 individual songs. Sir Frederick Madden was keeper of manuscripts at the British Museum. His work took him into auction rooms regularly, and his interest in broadsides was sparked by his purchase of a collection of 18th century ballads in 1835. He then began to assemble a collection that eventually reached 16,000 items of street literature. He purchased most of these directly from the printers, generally in pristine condition. With help from his wife, Madden arranged and pasted these into large volumes. The Clift's ballads are all in the volume that you see here. Volume 23, Country Printers, number 8. Among the documents surviving with the collection in the Cambridge University Library is a short note from William Cliff to Frederick Madden. It reads, Sir, I have looked over my stock of songs and have sent one of each, nine dozen, and a sheet song printed at Oxford. I am not aware of any other person besides myself who prints songs in this neighbourhood. I am, sir, your obedient servant, William Clift. Now this confirms that Madden obtained his ballads directly from Clift, and it also reveals that nine dozen, i.e. 108 sheets, were sent, though the number in the collection is now only 89 that he was not aware of any neighbouring printers who publish songs may seem a little surprising, since we know that at the same time Thomas Willey was active in Cheltenham, 15 miles away, and Joseph Ricketts in Highworth, 17 miles away. Perhaps this reflects the difficulties of travel in those days, though the railways were already starting to change this. I've searched the indexes and catalogues of other major collections and found that the Bodleian Library had only one broadside by Clift. And then I heard of a small collection of broadsides at the Cricklade Museum. The collection had been given to the Cricklade Historical Society by one of its founder members, H. W. J. Cuss, and came from his grandfather, William Stevens. The sheets had been sewn together to form a rough book, but have now been separated. Without further information, we can only speculate on the use that was made of this book and whether Stevens used it for singing or reading aloud, or simply gathered them for his private enjoyment. However they were employed, the ballads have seen some hard times, and many are in poor condition, with significant parts missing. There are 36 broadsides in the collection, of which 10 were printed by William Clift. Of the remainder, 17 are from London, and the rest are from Cheltenham, Birmingham and Brighton. 16 of the London broadsides were printed by James Catnack, and three of these list the stationer Shatford of Sirencester among the country outlets. This slide also gives me the opportunity to show another feature of William Stevens' collection, which is that the illustrations of several of the Catnack broadsides have been coloured. While some broadside ballads were sold with hand colouring, I think that the work in this case may be that of one of William Stevens' older children. Of the ten broadsides in the Stevens' collection that were printed by Clift, only one is identical to a copy in the Madden collection. In another case, the song is the same, but the illustrations are different. Clift, like many broadside printers, gave his sheets stock numbers, though he wasn't consistent. Sometimes he didn't apply a number, some numbers he reused for a different song, and sometimes he might keep the stock number for a particular song, but then give it a different partner. As an example, 
Here's number eight, the Enniskillen Dragoon from the Madden collection. <clears throat> All carry the same stock number, but there are three different pairings, two different illustrations, neither of which is relevant, and two different spellings of Enniskillen. The song text is consistent between the versions, though it differs in some respects from those of other printers. Like many small printers, Clift used a limited number of woodcut blocks to illustrate his ballads. I've found 42 images in total, and they're very mixed in subject and character. The limited range of options meant that the same illustration might have to do duty for a number of different ballads. These are his six favourite illustrations. The most popular and useful was the ship, which made an appearance whenever the song was about the sea. But the choices were not always so appropriate. Here is the soldier and his dog. At least I think he's a soldier. And here he is again. He is just about relevant to Joan the Marine, but the others are a bit of a stretch. I have to admit that Clift's typesetting and proofreading, while not the worst I have come across, are pretty awful. Here's an example that I think he must have left to The Apprentice. Apart from the spelling errors and a couple of problems with spacing, you can see an N replacing a U and some stray italic letters. Clift might have banked on the fact that the reader's eye usually skips over a few small errors, but I think that this collection might have stopped anyone in their tracks. But here's a particularly egregious example, the Bonnie Breast Knot. Now, apart from the totally irrelevant illustration, the only theme connecting it to the song being breast, he, or the aforementioned apprentice, has failed to spell his own name correctly. Having described the broadsides themselves, it would be as well to say a little about the songs printed on them. Taken as a whole, I would describe them as a rather conservative collection. There are no execution ballads or dreadful monsters, and not a lot of sex and violence. The double entendre in Clift's version of the mower might pass without notice or with no more than a knowing wink. There are a lot of old favourites, the streams of lovely Nancy, the farmer's boy, the female cabin boy. Richard of Taunton Dean, young Henry the Poacher and lovely Joan, for example. There are soldiers and sailors and some women who dress up to follow them. There are some ballads of social comment, lamenting hard times and unscrupulous tradesmen. And there are the songs expressing nostalgia for a better past or a better place. God Save the Queen was probably published to mark the accession of Queen Victoria and features new verses by the Reverend W. Lampart, such as Let war's red flag be furled, let peace throughout the world bless her mild reign. Ne'er may her sceptre wave, or one base venal slave, Queen of the free and brave, long live the Queen. And there's also a lengthy new song in praise of Her Majesty Queen Victoria, which I'll say rather than sing. Welcome now, Victoria, welcome to the royal throne. May all trade soon begin to stir, beloved Queen of England. For your most gracious majesty may see what dreadful poverty is to be found on England's ground, beloved Queen of England. Of all the flowers in full bloom, adorned with beauty and perfume, the fairest is the Rose of June. Victoria, Queen of England, and so on for another seven verses. 
There are two songs that were published by Clift which I've not found anywhere else. The first is The Baking Day. In this song, six old women go to the bakehouse for a good old gossip. The devil sits outside the door with a sheet of parchment to write down what they say. He soon filled it on both sides and stretched it again and again to write more until it was seven yards long. The last verse says, Were five and forty lawyers all placed in a row to keep pace with women's tongues they would have enough to do? And if upon a baking day they never must be idle, for six old maids have more to say than would fill a parish Bible. The other song is The Dreadful Bonnet, in which a woman reports that she's being criticised for her headgear and vows to save to buy herself a dunstapool and a leghorn, two types of straw bonnet, and decorate them with blue ribbons. The saint in the illustration has a halo rather than a bonnet. As I said at the outset, this is a work in progress. I'd like to do more analysis of the songs he printed to try to establish where he obtained his texts. It seemed probable that he got the words of the songs he printed from broadsides published by another printer. I'd also like to discover more about the first 38 years of Clift's life and find out where he learned his trade. It would be interesting to discover more about his place in the Society of Sirencester, but I'm pleased with what I've managed to uncover so far. One of the most exciting and symbolic moments was lifting a carpet in Sirencester Church and seeing where his remains lie. I hope that in this presentation I've communicated some of that excitement to you. Thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, please get in touch. And if you'd like to read the article on which this talk is based, you'll find it in the book Street Literature and the Circulation of Songs, edited by David Atkinson and Steve Roud, and published by The Ballad Partners.